Okay folks, welcome across to the channel. Today I want to run through and build a couple of these brewery temperature controllers that I've actually been using uh, up at Idle Valley Brewery to control fermentation. You can also use them on your conditioning tanks to heat and cool. They, they, they'll run a glycol pump, they'll run a heater, they'll pretty much drive anything you like that needs an intelligent input from some type of a microcomputer like an STC-1000. So as I say, I've been using these temperature controllers now for over two years. Initially we started using the STC-1000s to control fermentation temperatures in, in brew fridges. A lot of you guys are already doing that now if you've got a brew fridge at home. But this one goes a little bit further. So in the centre here it shows you the STC-1000. So the sensor basically picks up the temperature of the tank and depending on what you've set it for it will activate the heating or cooling relay within the STC-1000 respectively. So let's say you've set it for 18 degrees centigrade and the temperature starts to climb to 22 degrees so what will happen on this system is the cooling relay will activate and then that will also send power to the valve open and close relay and then that will open and close one of these motorized valves that we use now this is set to control the flow of your cooling agent in our case glycol going into a jacket and it'll turn it on and off when required so what happens is this relay will change the polarity of these wires depending on which type of uh, CRO2 motorized valve you've got some of these have two wires some of them have three wires basically your wiring is almost the same the only difference being with the three wires you have the yellow wire always going out to the negative on the 12 volt supply down here and it's just switching the positive between the red or the blue wire. If you don't have that, like this one here is just a red and a black, then basically what we're going to do is we're just going to alternate the polarity. So it will just basically reverse the polarity on these two wires. So red will go negative and black will go positive. And then when it turns off, red will go back positive again, black negative and close the valve. So we have a little 12 volt uh, DC power supply here. It's basically just a 1 amp LED driver power supply. Uh, I'll leave a, in the description a list of all of the components required. But this is input 110 to 220 volts AC. Um, and the output is positive 12 volts, uh, 1.25 amps. So there's without a doubt enough power within this little fella to activate this uh, mechanism. We've been using it two years and we haven't had one fail on us yet. So now that the valve is open on your system and the STC is calling for cold we need to turn the glycol pump on because there's no point having the glycol pump turned on all the time effectively pumping glycol into a dead end. So the idea is that you also use the power out from the cooling relay to activate the pump relay which is the glycol pump relay and then that will allow your live power because all you're going to do is just break the live feed to the glycol pump and the neutral can go into a neutral bus somewhere along the line and when it is activated this relay it will close the contacts thus allowing the glycol pump to turn on and what we've done after you've made one unit you can daisy chain these units together so you'll have a couple of lines out enabling you to activate the glycol pump from the relay in the next unit and the next unit and the next unit depending you can we've got uh, four five six seven we've got nine of these all working uh, in series and 
if one of them activates, the glycol pump will turn on. If all nine of them activate, it makes no difference, the glycol pump is still on. And then if one of them turns off, the only difference is the valve will close and the glycol can't get to that particular fermenter. And then once they're all off, this contact will open again and all of them will be off. You'll have one of these pump relay contacts in each box. So basically I'm going to just show you how to build the main box. And then depending on how many fermenters you want to control with it, it will dictate whether you have this section, the next unit section, with these cables coming out. And for the first unit, you obviously need your power coming in. So we have a live bus bar and a neutral bus bar, and we've got live and neutral coming into those respectively. For the next unit, you don't need the power in because you're daisy chaining off of these bus bars, look, into the next unit. You've got your live bus and your neutral bus. So these two cables out are effectively your power in on subsequent units. I'm sure you can understand. Uh, it sounds more complicated than it is. They are really quite easy to build. Take it one wire at a time um, and you'll get there, believe it or not. It's If I can do it, you can do it. Now this uh, temperature controller also has um, a third option where if you want to you can activate a heating uh, unit as well. So let's say that you're fermenting beer in a particularly cold season like now, it's winter time in the UK. Our tanks are big enough so they don't get that cold, they don't generally drop below sort of 18 degrees anyway because of the fermentation that's going on inside them and there's enough residual heat for the final two days for them to finish off. So if you've got smaller tanks or you're in a colder climate then it may be advisable for you to put some type of heating unit around your fermenter. The easiest way to do this is to buy an electric blanket that you would use in your bedroom and you could just wrap the electric blanket around the fermenter, leave the power cables poking out and then just hook up your power cables to this unit. So again, you'd have external power for this because your blanket may be consuming upwards of uh, 100 watts and we don't want to put too much load on these temperature controllers but basically what's going to happen is you've set your temperature controller for 18 the temperature drops to 15 the heating relay on the STC activates and it closes these two contacts on the heating unit relay so once those two contacts are closed then you can have your external power your live coming in on the common and on the normally open going back out to your heater and then your neutral would be also um, wherever your external power is coming from. All you have to do with these systems effectively is just break the live feed. You could break the live and neutral by using the other side of the relay because we use double pole double throw relays but it's more wires it's not really required. I find this very convenient and because each one of these heaters would have its own external power, like it's plugged in at the side of each fermenter, let's say, we don't daisy chain these because, like I said, we don't want to put um, a massive load on this power in. Because I've only got the one power in and I'm operating nine units, I know that the glycol pump runs at about 400 watts and then all of these units, you know, I don't think they're using more than 30 40 watts each so you can quite happily uh, daisy chain 10 of them first off we're going to need an STC 1000 these are readily available from eBay for around 12 pounds in the UK you can get them slightly cheaper from China there are UK stockists I know the same goes for the States dead easy to get hold of they do them in 110 versions as well as 220 relatively cheap don't go for the other option which I've seen on there they've got some cheap knockoffs they don't have the heating relay unless of course that's not an issue for you but uh, I prefer the real McCoy and then next we have a couple of LY 2NJ 10 amp 240 volt AC 10 amp 28 volt DC double pole double throw relays with sockets 
Now these sockets, you can buy all these individually. So normally we just wire the socket in and then whenever a relay starts to burn out, because these do fail, particularly if there's a bit of moisture around and with extremes of temperature, you basically, the coil starts to go brown and dark and uh, you get a little bit of verdigris on the contacts inside the, inside the relay itself. So these are also available on, on eBay, really cheap. You can get them all set up from maybe a UK stockist for about a fiver. You could get them down to two or three pounds each actually. Uh, and basically you can see on the bottom here, um, if you can see, if we can get it to focus, all of the contacts are numbered. We've got one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think that's what it says there. Yep. So basically seven or eight, seven and eight are your coil contacts. They're what are going to run on 240 volt AC. If you want to scale down, you can get 24 volt DC and 12 volt DC relays in exactly this style, which is very handy. And then the next two contacts up are your common. So whatever you connect on here is basically your supply. And then if you want your supply to be on all of the time, you'd connect to your normally closed. And then when the relay activates, it breaks it. It breaks the... Uh, the contact and you see the front ones or if you now what if you or if you want to use it like we're going to do in this instance to control the pump we'll be connecting to this pin here the second one down which is pins three and four so basically the terminals are open and then when the coil is activated the magnet pulls that in and then you have a continuous flow of electricity from there up through the uh magnetically operated armature around and down to the common and you can see that's the simple action of a relay if you've never seen one before but I imagine you probably have so we'll just pop that lid back on so we need two of these because we're using 240 volts in we can use these 240 volt uh, coil relays and of course these will also handle uh, 10 amps, up to 240 volts, 10 amps on on the switching side if you wanted to, but we're not using that much. We're only using like 1.6 for the glycol pump and practically nothing for the LED driver. And that brings us next to the LED driver. Of course, these are available um, in many different styles. This is the first time I've picked up one of these actually. But you can get the normal plastic ones. They're all very much the same. Um, what I'm going to probably do is see if this fits in as it is. If not, I might take the uh, take the outer casing off to give it a bit more room. In fact, there we go. It looks like it just pings off anyway. There we are. So this is just a switch mill power supply. So you've got your AC coming in. Uh, comes through a little glass fuse, through a bridge rectifier, uh, smoothing capacitor, and then it gets uh, taken down, stepped down to 12 volt DC through this transformer, and you get your 12 volts out on these two pins. If you want to see a breakdown of one of these, go across to um, bigclive.com, his channel, he takes these apart all the time. This doesn't look like the best put together one that I've seen before. Um, but they're cheap and cheerful, they do the job. A little control chip in there as well. Feedback capacitor on this side. But yeah, I'm learning a lot about these. Is that an inductor? I mean, look at that, how that inductor's been put on there. It's, it's all over the place. And then there's a little potentiometer on here to just trim the voltage and an LED. To tell us that she's on. Uh, so that's your 1.25 amp 12 volt power supply. The next thing we're going to need is the solenoid, the actual um, 
motorised valve, not solenoid. The solenoid's different to this. This is a motorised valve, so it's a ball valve in there. You're probably familiar with these ball valves on your brew kettle. This is essentially the same thing. The only difference is it doesn't have a lever on the top. It has some fancy electronics inside and um, it opens and closes on command when you put some voltage across the terminals. This is the 12 volt version and it's the DN is this the DN15? Yes it is the DN15 which you can just see there. So if you want to just have a little snapshot of what we've got written on the top then uh, how's that for you? But like I say, this is just telling you of all the different styles and varieties. These are available on eBay. I think, if memory serves me right, you're going to be looking at paying around 15 quid for one of these. So this is probably the most expensive individual component. But again, uh, if you wanted to buy a recognised name brand, you're talking upwards of £50, £60 pounds sterling. So these actually work really quite well. If anything does fail on them, it's generally going to be the electronics, so it'll either fail open or closed. That's not terribly bad. The worst outcome is you're going to freeze a beer or it won't get cooled. But like I say, I've not had one of these fail on me yet, and I run my glycol at minus 18 degrees centigrade. They cope. And then, of course, we're going to need a live and a neutral bus bar. So all I've done is nip into the local Wilco's or home despot or whatever you've got local to you and just picked up some of these terminal blocks this one's rated for 16 amps more than enough more than enough this will do two actually you should probably end up chopping this in half so we've got two four six on each block that's more than enough can you see that I'm in shot two four six so we'll chop them in half but I'm actually going to be building two of these boxes today which is why I've got two and then we're going to need um, a project box. So this particular box is what I've used in the past. It's 190 by 150 millimetres. Everything fits inside and it's snug. I wouldn't go any smaller would be my advice. I would like to mount things differently today but chances are I'm going to do the same way that I've done in the past because I know it all fits. So generally we'll have the STC on this end here and the two relays will be sat inside about there. You'll see as we get going. And um, then of course we need some cable. So for signalling cable I've just got some foam wire and I've stripped the foam wire down and I've taken out the innards. So we've got a bit of orange and orange stripe bit of blue. Now these are perfectly fine for handling 12 volts DC. The phone lines in the UK run at 48 volts DC I'm led to believe so this should handle 12 volts no problem. That's what we've got on our stuff now. And then of course we're going to want some heavier uh, cable for running the um, 240 side of it all, 220 side. So I've just got some 2.5 mil uh, flexible multi-strand cable. You could probably go down to um, a 1.5 mil square if you like, particularly if you're not running many boxes off of it and particularly if you're just going to be powering the inside of this unit and sending a thicker cable out to your glycol pump. Completely up to you. But this is what I've got, so this is what I'm using. I've got some brown as well. And then of course we need to get the cables into the box. So we've got a couple of uh, glands, just a couple of these nut glands, the little rubber grommet inside that tightens up around the cable as you tighten the grommet. You've seen them before. So basically that is the kit. So uh, I'm going to have to go away and I'm going to have to cut some holes in our lovely project box in order to fit these components inside and then we'll do a little bit of wiring up.